You are about to enter the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast on shockwaveskullsessions.com. And now your host, Bob Nalbandian. Greetings, fellow Skullheads, and thanks for joining us here on another episode of the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast. Co-host and producer Matt Hartnett here with you from the studio in San Lorenzo, California. Just to give you guys and gals a brief update, we originally were preparing to have an in-studio appearance this weekend, as we mentioned on the previous podcast. And unfortunately, due to time constraints and commitments, the band was unable to make it in here as they are they're currently touring and with you know with traffic just being as crazy and, and insane as it is here in the Bay Area, unfortunately the guys were unable to make it in. However, we are still planning on getting these guys on a future episode real soon once they wrap up their tours. So we had to switch gears here a little bit and you know, but hey, let your heart not be troubled as we are ready to unleash two brand new episodes for you this week. We had a real fun time yesterday chatting up with Chris Aiken and Neely from the Classic Mental Show, and that episode will be up in a couple of days, so be on the lookout later in the week for that. And as for this episode, I had the real pleasure of interviewing Tom Hazelmeyer. Tom, for the you know for those of you who are not familiar with him, he's the owner and brains behind the notorious Amphetamine Reptile Records out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, more commonly known as AMREP. And for those of you who are not familiar with Tom and Anrep, they were the label that were responsible for the emergence and initial success of several bands. Uh, one of them was 90s groove metal stalwarts Helmet, who went on to have a great career. And, were, you know, they were one of the top middle acts in the early to mid 90s and went on to have uh, mainstream success with their breakout release Meantime back in 1992. Yeah, Helmet, you know, they toured with bands like Sepultura, Ministry, Prong, you know, just to name a few. And along with Pantera, we were probably the biggest groove metal act that took off after grunge had peaked in the early 90s. And Amrep released their first LP from Helmet. They released Strap It On back in 1990, where it really all started for them. So we, you know, we talk a bit about his experiences working with Helmet, who were arguably the biggest metal band that were, you know, was coming out back in the early 90s there. And, you know, AMRAP was also responsible for the release, 1995 release, Scattered, Smothered, and Covered from Noise Metal Heavyweights, Unsane. For those of you who are not familiar with Unsane, they were very well established in the underground rock and metal scene in New York City back in the early to mid-90s that were known for their gory and controversial album covers and videos. Uh, they had a video for the song Scrape on that album that was played extensively on MTV, you know, on Headbangers Ball. And, you know, some of you might remember them also from playing at the Ozfest back in 98, as well as a, a North American tour they did with Slayer back in 1996. And, you know, MREP is also known as the home of the Melvins um, after they were finished with Atlantic, you know, Atlantic Records obligations in the mid 90s. as uh, And they also still continue to release. Uh, some seven inches from the grunge metal pioneers themselves. And, you know, and also about five years ago, there was a, a really awesome documentary that came out called The Color of Noise, uh, which is essentially, it's a semi, you know, autobiographical film based on Tom Hazelmeyer and uh, Amphetamine Reptile Records. And it's really just a great watch if you love heavy music in general. Um, you know, Amrep, they were definitely more, you know, of like a punk based label, but not. Your, your radio friendly, typical kind of punk music, like, you know, like The Offspring and Green Day, none of that kind of crap. Um, they, the music they released was definitely really heavy and edgier. I mean, real distorted vocals. I guess you could kind of call it extreme punk metal or something like that. You know, obviously, there was no real label to put on a lot of these bands, which is really how they got uh, known for the the whole noise rock label. And that's what they were really known for was signing the noise rock bands. And, you know, and Tom talks about, you know, a bit about that. And, uh, you know, he's just a real good guy, real genuine guy, you know, and if you're a fan of heavy music in general, you definitely, I th- like I said, need to check out The Color of Noise. It's uh, it's really hard not to be impressed with this guy's career and, and what he did with such a small independent label out of Minneapolis, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, which you know, it was a place not really well known for having a heavy music industry presence. So I uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoy this one. And once again, be on the lookout for episode number 27 as well later in the week with Chris Aiken and Neely from the Classic Metal Show. And yeah, Hope you enjoy it, guys. Take care. Well, uh, well, welcome to another episode of the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast. Our very special guest today is Tom Hazelmeyer, who is uh, a man who wears many hats in the art and music world. And he's had uh, many successful endeavors over the years as a musician, an artist, a record executive, and overall entrepreneur as well. And 
And most know Tom both as the guitarist, vocalist, and main songwriter for esteemed noise rock pioneers Halo of Flies, as well as the founder and brains behind the legendary independent record label Amphetamine Reptile, no more casually to many as AMRAP. And uh, he also currently continues his passion for conjoining art music with his Hayes Double XL imprint. And uh, it's great to have him on the episode. Uh, thanks for coming on, uh, Tom. You know, just briefly before we get into the. Uh, you know, more of the history of AMREP. You know, um, myself personally, I'm a bit of a record label junkie, you know, and ever since I got into underground music, I became really interested in, you know, even kind of obsessed about record labels. I mean, I don't know why, it's just, you know, when I would, when I'd buy records and CDs, there was just this sort of inclination to kind of right away look at the back of the record and notice that, that label logo. And I always wanted to know, you know, where the label was based out of, what other bands were on the label, et cetera. And, you know, I guess I just love the artwork to these logos because, you know, they're really colorful and more cool looking than, say, you know, Atlantic or, you know, most of those logos I would see on the records, you know, I purchased as a youngster before really getting into underground music. And, uh, you know, because of this infatuation I had, I wound up working at a handful of labels, you know, in New York and L.A. And I started my own label, you know, for about five years. And just, you know, I really enjoy delving, you know, deep into the inner workings as well as, you know, a lot of the trials and tri triumphs of hard rock and independent labels. You know, one of the things I wanted to do when I did this podcast was give some attentions to, you know, individuals, um, you know, like yourself who, who owned and ran their own, uh, you know, independent record label. And, you know, speaking of logos, you know, and Amphetamine Reptile, you know, always had that really, you know, unique looking, really cool, you know, noise font in the back of it. I always loved that, you know, and I know, you know, you're an artist yourself. Did you create that logo at all? Yeah. I mean, it, in part it was, uh, the general design of it was stolen for, I used to work in a, in a factory in the uh, parts room. Okay. So I was the one that had to go yank this, that, and the other thing for different jobs. Mm -hmm. And there was this, this logo for Cyclops Corporation. I don't even know what, I can't remember what they made, mm -hmm. but it was, it's kind of roughly based on that. Okay. And that was the, the circular part of it. Okay. The noise thing, it just kind of threw in there to balance out. Mm -hmm. Like literally at that point in time, noise had no meaning beyond literal noise mm -hmm. you know it wasn't like a statement or or a manifesto in one word it was literally just like what word would look cool because i need a, i need something behind this to balance okay. out you know the whole the whole thing and, and just literally settled on noise which i mean i wasn't opposed to i like the idea of, of it you yeah. know it looked great so i just kind of went from there well speaking of that you know the the whole you know the noise rack label so this was you even had that on there before that was even such a you know, labels as a genre. Is that correct? Like you just, I mean, it's kind of be, it, it, it definitely has, has gone on to be a genre. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you know, according to the internet, <laughs> uh, you know, there's just like different groups that refer to it, uh, as such. I, I, I do like the fact that it's, I don't think it's completely, uh, hard cast. Like, and if you say hardcore punk, Mm -hmm. The second I said that, you knew exactly what I said. Sure. Mm -hmm. Whereas the noise seems to be a bit, bit more broad in description, mm -hmm. from you know almost borderline, you know, metal to angular stuff, math kind of based. You know, it's kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. No, sure. I mean, I, I know you stated in, in uh, you know the film uh, the color of noise, which we're going to talk about you know in a sec. But I know you you stated something about that Seattle, you know, got the grunge label and then. You got the um, the noise label. I mean, I mean, like you said. So th that label itself, it was just kind of because you know a lot of times these you know these these labels or these genres, you can never really pinpoint where they were even conceived. It fascinates me sort of how these how they get attached to these genres, you know, because no one really uh, can I, tell I, you. I mean, you know? I'm, <laughs> I've never. I've, I guess when I was younger, a lot younger, I would look at kind of genre stuff just to delineate what I wanted to pursue. You yeah. know. Mm -hmm that band is kind of, kind of punk. So it's like, okay, that's what my alley was, you know, type of thing. Whereas at what it's, it's almost to a, the, the point of annoyance now where it's like, literally people are going back in time and genre finding shit. That didn't sure. Exist. I know. It's ridiculous. Like, I know. Oh, this is freak beat. No one ever said the <laughs> fucking word freak beat in 1966. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But yeah, it's like, totally. no, we're going to delineate and put these guys in this corral. These guys are over here. It's like, that's not what happened. It totally gets away from the history of it. Sure. And and the point in the movie I made was that we were all from the same camp, you know. Mm -hmm. I was living in Seattle at the time, so it's just hilarious that. But if we did it in Minneapolis, it wasn't grunge. Fine by me, because I mean, you know, the way that English press was going at it, you know, that had a life life limit, you know. Sure. But uh, at the same time, it's like it's just 
you know, in the past, it was something more often than not made up by the press just to make their lives easier. And then uh, it seems to have uh, come into its own words. Like uh, you know, the latter half of Gen X and millennials definitely love genrification. Mm, <laughs> totally. You know, yeah. that, that they've got 70,000, you know, genres under one banner. It's kind of bizarre. Mm-hmm. No, I, I totally you agree. Um, and like, you, you know, you mentioned Seattle. I know, um, you know, like, Many, you know, independent rock artists, you know, did and they still do, you know, today, of course. I mean, you started AMREP, um, you know, back in the mid-80s initially, you know, as a way to release, you know, music from, you know, your own band Halo Flies. And, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, about any of this, of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, you were, I believe, living, right, you said, right outside the Seattle area at the time when you were, you know, stationed here in the Marines. And, uh, and I know you, you started, you know, right around that same time, right, when Sub Pop and the grunge movement were just coming onto the scene. Um, and I know, like I said, you, you moved to Amrap, obviously, back to the, you know, the Midwest, to Minneapolis, where you had lived prior to, you know, being stationed out in Washington. Um, I'm not sure how much you experienced, but, you know, if, if there's anything you could tell us really about, you know, any of your experiences playing with, you know, Halo Flies in the, in the area at that time. And because there was, you know, obviously a correlation like we were talking about between the noise rock and, you know, the whole grunge, uh, you know, sound of Seattle at the time. Yeah. And that was uh, to me, it was I, I just had just split Minneapolis in 83, which had just gone through like huge creative explosion where like all the hardcore, a lot of all, all the people, not all the people, but a lot of people from the hardcore scene there, which was really, you know, small and insular and everyone pretty much knew each other, mm-hmm. you know, but out of that exploded like replacements and who's do and not far behind them was solo asylum. Mm-hmm. So right as that was happening, I joined the service and wound up out in Seattle and got to kind of, uh, lived through that again, which was like this creative explosion, which witnessing it twice in my life, you know, see certain elements, which is like a lot of bizarre um, counterpoints coming together and colliding. Mm -hmm. Um, And Seattle was kind of similar uh, to Minneapolis in that aspect where it was like, you know, a lot of blue collar kids mixing it up with a lot of art school kids, mixing it up with like a really vibrant gay community, just all these different groups colliding in the clubs. Mm-hmm. and making for some really good stuff, you know, really, really great kind of explosion. And everyone kind of got on the same page with, uh, you know, all right, everyone, let's have our key influence be the Stooges. No, go, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it, it, you know, it's funny cause it's like, I, I've, I've, I've mentioned it a dozen times in doing interviews and stuff, but it never seems to kind of click, but it's hilarious that, that all these writers that have just, you know, like completely focus the spotlight on what happened in Seattle because of all the Nirvana thing sure. have never correlated, looked at a picture of who's do or solo sound or replacements from 1982 mm-hmm. and like looked at the hair, the, the flannel shirts, mm-hmm. the zero, you know what I mean? Like totally. the quote unquote grunge look It's like, look up a re- you know, replacements photo from 1982. And actually, like I said, when I left Minneapolis, then going out, out to the West coast of Seattle area, like knew that all these people like fucking loved that stuff, mm-hmm. you know, but it's just funny that like we were talking about genreification and genres. There's the, that thing where it's like in these writers minds, there's this like line, what the hell would Minneapolis have to do with Seattle? Mm-hmm. And whereas it's, it's more of a free flowing, you know, liquid state than it is a, 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 you know, and then out of a vacuum came the Seattle theme. Seattle. It's like <laughs> bullshit, you know, no, totally. There was like, you know, the early, early punk rock, there was a ton of crossover between Seattle and LA. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, uh, names now, like the screamers, several of the screamers were from the Seattle area. Mm-hmm. And of course there's like, uh, you know, one of, one of guns and roses left was in the farts and stuff up in Seattle. There's mm-hmm. always been this back and forth. So it wasn't, it didn't, even though Seattle was pretty isolated, it wasn't, a, you know, completely an entity unto itself. No, totally. There's yeah. always that weird cross pollinization and shit going on, which I find fascinating. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, I'm, I'm glad you, you know, you brought up the thing about Minneapolis, you know, in the mid eighties, cause they really were sort of like an undervalued part of the whole, you know, hardcore punk history, you know, obviously with the emergence of, uh, you know, who's could do and, you know, they really led the way there for that, mid, you know, Midwest hardcore sound, um, even though, you know, they broke up there, you know, in the late eighties, it wasn't as long term as some of the other bands, but, you know, and I know, you know, Minneapolis in terms of like infamous venues, I know, you know, Duffy's, I know it was one of those that really, they, they brought a lot of the more like established sort of, Hardcore punk bands, as you mentioned, you know, from Southern California, like, you know, Black Flag and the Circle Jerks kind of got them into town. You know, also you had the uh, iconic, you know, First Avenue and 7th Street entry there, which is pretty much, right, a venue that that's helped, like, launch the careers of just about every successful artist that came out of, 
you know, the Twin Cities. Um, were there any specific shows, you know, or bands that really stuck out to you, like, in your experiences, you know, when you went to those venues as a, as a young rocker in, in Minneapolis? Um, I mean, it was hard to get, didn't, didn't do a lot of shows. I mean, it was still a 21 drinking age, you know, you know, it's obviously mm. pre, pre, for me, I split Minneapolis the first time around when I was 18, but, uh, there was a certain all ages shows like, yeah, uh, who's could do come in like the, one of the first big, really extensive tours they did was in 82. They had toured prior to that, but like a really, I, I can't remember how long off the top of my head. It was a two, three month run, but especially back in those days, that was, a, that was a bitch. Mm-hmm. And, uh, them coming back and everyone's like jaw hitting the floor, like how they had just, I mean, they were already fucking amazing. And then they literally jumped it up a few notches. Yeah. Well, they, they were you know, releasing like, tightness. yeah, they were releasing like two albums a year and stuff. Right? I mean, they were, they were torn like crazy. Right. I mean, they were, yeah, they were just a fucking machine. So yeah. Pretty much like they got rolling in 79 and 80, but by 81, 82, they were just started. That's when, you know, they really started coming into their own. Mm-hmm. And then it was pretty much a juggernaut straight through until they hit the fucking wall. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and I, we were t- you just mentioned before, you know, some of the uh, the Twin Tone bands, the Soul Sound Replacements, they were really gaining a lot of steam nationally. And I know a lot of the, the hardcore punk scene, a lot of that influence um, and popularity in, a, in, you know, in, in the Midwest there was kind of, especially in Minneapolis, was sort of going by the wayside, and, you know, and uh, there was more of that pop punk alternative scene that was really kind of coalescing there. Um, and this is really where, I guess, you know, Amrep and, and even your band, you know, Halo Fly sort of came in and you guys, you know, you kind of came in and reignited that, that hard rock and an edge of your side, right. That had been kind of missing for a few years. I mean, it seemed like, you know, uh, you know, you guys were really responsible for that, that revival. And, uh, you know, were, were, were there, were there any other labels like in that area? Was it just you? You were pretty much the, the main uh, label at that time around that whole Midwest area that, that would put out that kind of music. Correct. Yeah, I mean, it was like touch and go down in Chicago mm-hmm. and uh, there's some smaller, a couple uh, 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 I hate to mention because I'll, I'll, I'll mention one and forget the other, but there was like a couple small labels in maps like Skeen and oh fuck, A Bomb, a couple of, you know, that were doing really small, like literal bedroom release kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was kind of, that was, that was my shtick. It's like I, I was in love the initial wave of hardcore because it was like a, a new thing. I mean, I was already, I was a punk rock kid, but this was like, you know, completely jamming the main line with a whole, you know, fucking full rig of speed and it was, off and running and so it was great and then within a couple of years that it kind of putzed out creatively you know creatively it, it just become this like generic one two three four you know paint paint by numbers mm-hmm. so i was gone at that point like that's I, that's usually if something become coalesces that solid i'm i lose interest just because it's like I, you know what do i need you for i got minor threat what do i need you for I got, mm-hmm. you know that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah totally um, yeah. which is like, you know, we've been seeing that for 30 years now, <laughs> <laughs> in regards to certain hardcore stuff, mm-hmm. but that's just the, uh, snotty young kid stuck in that old man now. Sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, what, that was kind of, I, I was still chasing that, that dragon, you know, as far mm-hmm. as, uh, wanting something that, you know, hit me right between the eyes really fucking hard, mm-hmm. but I hadn't heard it before. So, I mean, that was kind of. That's what uh, we were trying to do at that point in time sure. with the label. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, like you said, so there was no real, I guess, particular like method. Were there any sort of like prerequisites that you, that a band needed in order to, you know, to be considered, to, you know, uh, to be on uh, AMREP? Or was it just basically based off of, you know, just being a fan of the music and, you know. It was it. literally, if we if it, if it lit, lit our world on fire, we were jumping on it. Okay. I mean, we signed bands from everything from demos mailed in to, seeing them open for somebody else to, you know, word of mouth. Um, there was no tried and true that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, 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 what was probably systematic is we were, uh, you know, we did everything in house. We literally had a you know recording studio built in to the, you know, to the, our offices, which were an old, you know, 1950s doctor's office in, our, right. in a rough area of town mm-hmm. and uh, built the studio downstairs and like, you know, literally all the graphics and the recording and, and, you know, we're kind of a machine that way. It's like five guys, you know, five to six guys at any given time. But, you know, we worked the shit out of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, always gave the impression that we were much larger than we were, which kind of cracked us up. That's good. I mean, yeah, that's good, that's good the business right were there. Tight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, we're a huge corporate, mega death corporation. It's like, <laughs> it's five guys in the dilapidated office, you know. Uh-huh. But, uh, but um, you know, that, that, that level worked kind of nice. 
but th- that that part was a machine. But the other thing, it was just like you know, uh, um, there was no no guidebook as far as what got signed and when it got signed or how it got signed. Yeah, you know, and I'm glad you brought up the whole um, you know uh, Seattle sort of Minneapolis like the similarities between the two. You know, we recently on on the podcast here, we we recently did an episode that we talked about really the sort of the uh, pre-internet challenges that you know a lot of bands and artists in middle America kind of faced, you know, in order for their music to get noticed, you know, back in the, uh, you know, like I said, before the internet and uh, especially towards, you know, the end of the 80s. I mean, you know, most, uh, if not all of the, you know, more successful independent rock labels, they were all based on the coast, right? Of course, you had, as we mentioned, we had Sub Pop and, you know, California had SST, Triple X, Alternative Tentacles. You had Discord in D.C., you know, New York, there was a whole bunch. I mean, you know, most of the time the bands, you know, who were from, those areas, Midwest, or, you know, just in middle America, they had to either, you know, move to the coast if they really wanted any chance for their band to get, you know, noticed. Um, yeah, a lot of the labels, they were just kind of lazy. They weren't really interested in venturing out to those areas of the country to find talent. And, um, you know, I know in the Midwest, I mean, there was a lot of burgeoning little scenes at the time. They were bursting with talent, especially in and around those college towns. Like, you know, off the top of my head, you know, one of the areas we talked about, too, on the podcast was, you know, in Madison, Wisconsin, for instance, was one of those scenes. And, you know, there was like, for instance, you know, just an example, there was a, a band out of there called, I don't know if you ever heard of them, they were called Last Crack. Um, they, they had been signed on, you know, a metal label, even though they were more of a, an alternative band. And, uh, you know, my, my partner here, Bob, he actually worked for the label at the time. And he was telling me that, you know, when they were trying to promote the band, you know, at that time in the early 90s, um, if, 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 you were, if you were a band that wasn't from Seattle, you know, even if, if you had that sound, even if you sounded great, the radio stations, man, they wouldn't even give you the time of day. Actually, you had to be from Seattle. So it was sort of that coastal elitist bias sort of thing. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously... Yeah, you, that coastal elitist bias only existed on the fucking coast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, there was, I mean, like that, that battle. But, I mean, one of the things we focused on with Infinity Reptile was, like, sending the bands into uh, uh, Iowa City and Madison across the Midwest that... Like because of the bias you're talking about on both the coasts, they just would ignore it. It's like, what's that town? How many people can get a show? Only only 400 man. And fuck it, mm-hmm. you know, blow it off. Um, and uh, that worked fu- amazing. Like we had market um, in places you would never expect because we would send the bands in there mm-hmm. repeatedly to just out of the way. So you really so focused. All, all the names are escaping me, but it was just like that was one of the things, and we didn't ignore that because it's like we're we're from there. We're from fucking flyover country. Mm-hmm. You know, we know what it's like. So it's like hitting up that station, you know, that college radio station. It's really small in, in backwoods, Missouri. They fucking appreciate the shit out of it because mm-hmm. no one will bother with them because they're not big enough for, you know, they're not listening to Rock Bowl. They're not listening to CMJ. Fuck them. That, you know, be the attitude of every, you know, mm-hmm. all the larger labels. Sure. And mm-hmm. it's like, you know, like I said, we, we were those same kids. So we knew exactly what that, you know, how hungry those kids were too. So that, that was never our focus. It's like, yeah. You know, we, we would do all the the stuff you had to do and and uh, be, to do the CMJs and the, and the new music seminars and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But then again, we were, were were pretty jumping up and down when when um, you know uh, South by Southwest started mm-hmm. and uh, you know helped them out quite a bit just to, to because it was like you know we got a fair shake there mm-hmm. sure, right. versus new music seminar where it's like a lot of insider trading, you know. I mean, yeah, you guys were kind of like, you know, the antithesis of that method. Like you said, I mean, I didn't realize that you actually had, had focused on, you know, sending your bands into those areas, which I think was obviously very smart to do so. Because, I mean, you even had a lot of bands on your label that, that were from the coast, right, that went up signing with you guys. So it wasn't like you just signed, you know, Midwest, you know, bands or so forth. I mean, it was other bands that were from yeah, we, New York, we were, especially we New York. We weren't Discord you know? with, the, with, with the rule list, like, you know. I, I'm always amazed at that with the Discord. Like, it's got to be local. You just think about all the bands that you passed. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, we worked with, I worked with uh, bands from, uh, uh, a lot of bands from out of New York, you know, like Boss Hog, which was something John Spencer started doing even during Pussy Galore days. Surgery, Unsane, those guys were like hardcore, you know, New York sure. City kind of stuff. Um, later on, we worked, you know, Choke Bar out of L.A., Melvin's, which were kind of, we started working with them. They were in San Francisco and then wound up being a L, pretty much an L.A. band, which it's hilarious because no one ever talks to them as being an L.A. band. They always refer to Seattle, which they never actually lived in. Mm-hmm. They were south of Seattle right there, right? They were like an hour, hour outside Mount Santa, like an hour outside of Seattle, small town kids. And mm-hmm. when they, it was time to like, you know, pack up and move to Seattle, they just said, fuck that, and went straight to San Francisco. San Francisco yeah. But to this day, in everyone's mind, they're still completely, you know, tied Seattle. to Seattle. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of that, too, I mean, you, you know, Amber, you, you guys were sort of like the uh, – 
I guess, sort of like the refuge for some of those, <clears throat> you know, uh, Seattle, you know, other than Melvin's, but I mean, like Tad and Mudhoney did some stuff with you guys. Um, you were sort of like a, a label that if, if, you know, some of these bands that were sort of chewed up and spit out by the major label machines, you kind of gave them like a, at least a, for a little while, you gave them a home until they were able to sort of recover and from that corporate experience, you know, which is, you know, I think while, why both the label and yourself personally were really were so well, you know, well respected among the independent rock and roll community back in those days. I mean, you guys really helped out a lot of those bands. I mean, that definitely was the case of the Melvins. I mean, with some of the stuff like uh, Mud Honey, we actually put their first song out, released their first song ever. So we were like, there at the beginning. But that was, that was a sure. ties to living out there, too. I was out there for like three years. Mm-hmm. And by the time I left, I completely had plugged in to what was shaking out there, which I said was fucking amazing at the time. You know, mm-hmm. that moment of like the spark, you know, it's completely underground is, that's a magical shit. <laughs> and did you, was there was there a lot of competition between like Amrep and all those like those labels I had mentioned? I mean, did you get into any like bidding wars over you know any of those acts or something? Or you just kind of veered away from that stuff? I don't think there was an indie that would bother with a bidding war. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like not like any of them had enough money it. to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I mean there, there, the thing is, there was like to me, to my mind, it was like there were so many bands to pick from, you know, that I thought were worthy of working with. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the, the problem was the resources to do them all. I certainly wasn't going to spend all our resources on getting that band. Mm-hmm. Um, that left that up to the majors to piss their money away doing that shit. So I mean, and it wasn't. You know, I think there was like a, a largely huge sense of co- cooperation. You know, it wasn't it wasn't very competitive. I don't. Re- I personally don't recall a lot of competitive. Like all oh, those bastards. Yeah. And they did X, Y, and Z. We got to catch up to them and, you know, stomp their guts out. <laughs> there was usually more of a, a working together with like ba- putting bands together for tours and, you know, putting up mm-hmm. people when they were in, in your, in your town and that kind of thing. Then there was uh, competitiveness. You know, I, I was going to say as someone, you know, uh, myself who, who did a, owned a label for about five years, you know, one of the things that kind of soured me on keeping the label afloat was, you know, I mean, on top of the fact that, you know, I was losing a shitload of money, you know, uh, it was also, it was also the fact that it was really <laughs> easy to do, you know, easy to do, very easy to do. Right. I mean, but it was also, it just, it was really hard to keep every band on the label, you know, happy. I mean, obviously it goes, That's with the impossible to do. it's impossible. Exactly. But, you know, a lot of the things I experienced was like, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, they were always paying attention to the other bands on the label and they would sort of get a little envious and would always feel like, you know, I was giving certain other bands more attention than the others. And, put more resources into other bands that they felt they should get and, you know, led to this false accusation of being, you know, you know, f- having favorites and all that crap. But I know, uh, you know, your situation was a little more complex because I mean, you, you had your own band, you know, Halo flies on the label and you would tour with a lot of, you know, obviously the acts that you signed. Um, and I, I, I thought it was pretty cool on the, on the film, in the documentary, you had that, the, the one time when you guys were in the UK and you had five bands on the, on the same bus was what, like 22 people or something. And, uh, I mean, I could, I could imagine how cool and yet chaotic that must've been, you know, but, um, but I love that the fact that, that you, yeah, I, I could imagine, man. And I love the fact that what you did was a, you, you know, as your own, your own band, you, you opened every show, right. Just to kind of get rid of that whole, like, you know, I work at a headline or something like that. Right. Halo of flies was the opener, right. Yeah, no, is, no one could, no one could fucking argue with me because yeah. what had changed in the, we set up the tour and in the meantime, in the meantime, that's a good point. <laughs> Helmet completely Helmet. fucking exploded. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was no doubt that a lot of people were there to see Helmet. Mm-hmm. So in order to put those guys on last and not catch the ire of three other bands, it was like, all right, I'm taking opener. They're closer. You guys are all rotating. Fuck off. You know, mm-hmm. you're going to sure. bitch to me, then you can have the opening slot. And that kind of settled it. But I mean, uh, in actuality, the funny part is uh, I think my own band was the one that got short shrift. A lot. <laughs> sure, you <laughs> must have. Yeah, the years, the years where it was crossover when I was doing my band and and the label, mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of stopped me from doing more touring that we should have done. In the end, it was just like, yeah, I enjoyed doing the record shit more than I enjoyed doing a band. One, one kind of snuffed out the other one. Gotcha. Yeah. No, I mean that's that's got to be real challenging. Obviously, you know, having to handle both of those, that's that's definitely got to be challenging. You know, and, and, you know, myself, I I grew up, you know, I grew up in New York City, and uh, in the late, you're one of the rare ones. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, I always, that. I always loved that going to New York. And one time, I remember when I was talking to drunk as shit. I was just like, watch this. Because we were having a conversation. I was like, you know how many people aren't from here? Uh-huh. So we just randomly <laughs> walked up to people, where are you from? <laughs> oh, I'm from Lansing. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from, you know, Billings, Montana. Oh, where are you from? Los Angeles. Where are you from? Los Angeles. Where are you from? You know, uh-huh. I think these motherfuckers are from here. Yeah. That's got to be, yeah, yeah. L.A. is like that, too. It's a same thing. You go to L.A. And, and no one's from there. It's just, you know, this is those media capitals. It's, 
it's the same shit, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, you mentioned earlier about the CMJ, you know what I mean? Because you know, that whole no- the noise rock scene, that was really big, you know, in the East Village there, you know, at CBGB's, the Pyramid Club, I remember. That was a pretty cool, you know, time, no, I-, I will say, in New York City especially, just because you had a big festival with a plethora of shows to see you can go from one club to the other. It was really cool. And I, I think, and you guys, you did you did a tour there, right? I think in the early 90s, you guys had your own MREP tour with Helmet and a bunch of those bands. Well, there was a bunch of different tours, but I mean, we always had a we would have a showcase. Okay. During uh, we did lots of showcases during NMS, the New Music Summer, and CMJ. Cause they were both they were pretty much neck and neck for what you're talking about. Where like everyone would converge on uh, everything independent and underground would kind of converge on New York for a week. Mm-hmm. There'd be so much cool shit going on. It was always always a good time. Yeah. Like I can't even imagine New York trying to do something like that now. First off, there's no fucking thing. No, I was just gonna say that exactly. <laughs> Look at the economy of it. I mean, for, I mean sure. back then I used to think like New York is like how the fuck do you guys exist? Like, remember I think it was on sand surgery and boss hog were all sharing one you know wet shitty basement closet that was the quote unquote their practice space. Oh wow! It smelled like bad ass and beer. Yeah, <laughs> and it was just uh. uh and, that, and it was, a, you know, that's what most of us were paying for a fucking apartment. Mm-hmm. And that was that. Fuck, this is now, meaning it's fucking thousand times worse. I, can't, I doubt there's even, you know, you could, could do a four band up there. The heavy punk and hardcore scenes in New York were a little more prevalent and influential with a lot of the youth at that time. But, um, you know, and there was even some of those, you know, more like metal leaning bands, you know, for instance, like White Zombie was one of them. People don't realize like they were originally sort of a noise art rock band. And then, of course, oh, they were totally, they, they were completely in that same circle. Mm-hmm. There was no delineation or separation. Those guys were part of that whole, that whole thing for sure. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, and of course, then, of course, we, we, you know, talking about probably the biggest band on I'm rep, you know, band I love, as we mentioned before, Helmet. I mean, I know, you know one of the things I loved about Helmet was, um, and a lot of my peers did as well, is, you know, they were just a bunch of regular looking dudes who just kicked your ass every time you see them live. And, you know, uh, like you know. no one was playing dress up, you yeah, know, exactly. Um, and then, and, and that's kind of what, one of the things where it's like, you know, I, I came up as like a, you know, punk rock kid and, you know, slash hardcore kid at a certain point, you'd, you know, just kind of had you know, just that whole, like, come on, quit playing fucking dress up, kill it. Just fucking kill it on fucking stage. I don't give a shit what buttons you have or what, you know, Who's peeing on the back of your leather jacket or whatever, you know, that kind of <laughs> exactly. thing. So. Yeah, no, I mean, and how did you how did you discover Helmet? You know, I mean, what, what you know, how did you guys get them on AMRAP? I mean, what, what, did you just kind of see them? Would you hear a demo? It was, or? Actually, it was, it was one of the, I, was, I was sharing offices with Twin Twin at the time, and uh, one of the women that worked there, Jill, was like, I was sitting in my office cranking on some stuff. She walked in and handed me this cassette. She goes, oh, we're going, to, I was going through demos, and this ain't Twin Tone, but you might, you know, you might like this. And I don't know if you've heard the early demo stuff. It's de- It's not wasn't quite helmet yet it was uh you know it was helmet meets glenn branca kind oh, of thing okay well on page you know I mean? like was... it's definitely more art school it's sure. definitely more art school but i'm playing it and i'm going this is really fucking good mm-hmm. and uh i played the shit out of it contacted page and said hey you know, guys want to do a single and uh they said yeah so we got a single out and right around that time halo flies was coming out to do some shows on the east coast and talked to my booking agent into getting them on the bill at, at uh uh Max Fish mm-hmm. over in Jersey, which was one of the biggest fucking mistakes ever made. Uh, just because you don't want helmet opening for you. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Especially, I think it was like 89. Probably, I'm guessing it's 89, mm-hmm. 88, 89, 90, somewhere right around there. And, uh, you know, they had in the meantime, gone from kind of art pounding to, Pounding, pounding, you know, mm-hmm. helmet. They turned into helmet, and I hadn't heard any of that new material. So mm-hmm. I'm standing there, all excited to see this band I really like that's open for us. You know, the band guy in me is going, You motherfucker, you just gutted your whole show because these guys rule. <laughs> this is like, there's no way I can fucking top that. Uh-huh. <laughs> and the business guy in me is just going, Oh, that's fucking amazing. Uh-huh. I'm so fucking stoked I'm in with these guys because this is one of the best things I've ever fucking seen. Yeah. I mean, they were, yeah. They it was were- a, it was a yin yang kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. No. They were. I mean. They, I mean. They're. Yeah. They were great, man. Um. You know. And it was funny when I go when I listen to like Strap It On now, for instance, man. You know. And, and even you know, in the meantime, I mean, no meantime album. I mean, one of the major things I take away from those albums, um, really, they kind of birthed. You know, which I'm sure they're probably not really too proud of. They kind of birthed through their sound that whole like new metal genre. You know, like the Corns and all those bands that were on MTV back in the late '90s. There. You know, when you listen to those riffs and those grooves. 
I mean, it's 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 so obvious that that's where they took you know most of their influence from. Um, oh, you know? yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I had no idea, you know, that um, that you know, meantime, and so that was uh, obviously, you know, eventually they they would go on to Interscope, and I know you got, you talked about that in the film and stuff. Um, but I, I I didn't know realize that had you guys recorded that prior to that being released Interscope, or at least you know, did you record a couple of songs? No, the only, the only thing they did prior to Interscope was uh, strap it on. Okay. And then um, Interscope just came barreling for them. Okay. It was also during that time, too, where it was like Nirvana just broke. So mm-hmm. all the majors were scrambling. You know, if anything had a buzz factor going on, they were jumping on it and giving away silly money to people you never heard of and never mm-hmm. heard from again. Wow. But uh, so they, they were kind of getting chased in that. And also, too, we were like literally half of our business was switching over to being the helmet label. You know, like every other phone call the mail order, you know, that type of thing. Like it was obvious those guys were going to fucking explode beyond what we could deal with. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of, on one hand, it was good to see it take off just cause it's like, you know, all right, back to normal at that time. So, I mean, they, they had actually recorded, uh, in the meantime with, you know, they were already contracted to, to, uh, uh, Interscope at that time. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, and another, you know, you mentioned before another legendary, you know, uh, band that was on your label out of New York city was insane. You know, they've, they uh, released the Scattered, Smothered, and Covered, you know, uh, record with you guys, which, you know, I personally and a lot of a lot of their fan base feels that that was their best work, you know, to date. And um, obviously they're known, if our audience here doesn't know, they're really known for their, you know, their gruesome artwork on the, on the album covers. And uh, also, you know, uh, that was it was mentioned in the documentary, they talked about, the, you know, the video for the song Scrape. Uh, that was, you know, on MTV. I remember seeing that thing on like 120 minutes. I think it was even on Headbangers Ball and stuff. And uh, what did that thing cost you? Like a couple hundred dollars to make? I mean, that must have been such a... Um... Yeah, it was a $600, $600 video that got into heavy rotation. Wow, yeah. And it probably single-handedly, like, yeah, launched a whole whole uh, genre of the internet, you know, the fuck-up. Mm-hmm. The fuck-up video. The fuck-up, yeah. Now there's whole <laughs> compilations of people falling downstairs. And it's like the whole jackass stuff. Ball. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, talk about getting your best bang for your buck, though. I mean, it's, I mean, just that much to, to get that much exposure, that's pretty, that must have done wonders, obviously, for uh, for that band and for that record. Yeah, no, it was it was great, too, because it was at the moment we, we'd been with Atlantic for not even a year. So that literally happened about 10 minutes after the door hit our ass on the way out from Atlantic. And I, I didn't so realize... Not, uh, it was an awesome fuck you to them. Like, oh, yeah, by the way, fuck you. <laughs> It's always nice to say fuck you to those majors, isn't it? Yeah, unfortunately, whoever you got to tell the fuck off is gone every 10 minutes. So That's true, too, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's like yelling at a McDonald's employee. It's like, what's the fucking point? <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I, didn't, I wasn't aware really uh, until recently. <clears throat> I wasn't aware that um, that your bandmate in Halo Flies, Tim Mack, that he actually produced that album, huh? The uh, Scattered, Smothered, and Covered? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, like we were talking about before, it was kind of all in the house when we built the uh, studio. Mac was the guy who pretty much ran it and did a recording a lot of uh, big chunks of, you know, cows, guzzer, love six, 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 hammerhead. Mm-hmm. Um, just lots of, lots of material from that period of time was when it was done at hammer up. He was the guy, that nice. you know, engineering it or quote unquote producing it. And then, and then they released, uh, what is the amber up Christmas after, right? And that was, that was on uh man's ruin. I know that's, uh, you know, a label from that's over here in the Bay area. And that was owned by, uh, you know Frank Kozik there, who's another you know, he's another guy like you who really has the same had the same aspirations in terms of uh, you know bringing music and art together, especially with the whole uh, the rock poster scene, which is something you know I know you you continue to do today, I believe like with you know the Melvins and Halo Flies, right? I mean, I mean that Cow's poster with the Fred Flintstone being that, that is just absolutely classic that poster. Um, and, you know, yeah, so, and, I, and you know, it's, it's one of those things with art and music you can never the older you get, the more you realize you can't convey to that kid, you know. Like, no, dude, yeah, you've seen this kind of a dawn of thought lines, but this was the first time, mm-hmm. you know. Totally. That, 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 especially with music, like talking to, to younger people where you just can't convey to them. It's like, well, that just seems kind of run of the mill. No, no, no. That was, you know, at the those time. guys at that moment in time, there was nothing fucking like it. Sure. And unfortunately, I, I think uh, that's, that element seems to be missing a lot. Absolutely. Well, I was going to, yeah. Groundbreaking, was... new kind of fucked up shit doesn't seem to happen not no. at the pace it used to oh because you know well, now you've got the you know the whole pc culture so even if it did you know, you'd have a whole bunch of isms attached attached to you if you did do that and of course with 
you know, the internet and, te- you know, and technology, there's just an oversaturated market. Everything's graphic design, right? So there's, um, you know, that, that I think what's missing is that whole, the tangibility factor that goes with, right? It's, it's so much more, it resonates so much more when you're seeing it posted outside on a venue wall or a telephone or traffic light pole than on a, you know, a fucking computer screen. You know what I mean? And um, I, 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 Definitely. But at the same time, too, I think part of it is that I don't, I don't see as many younger people pursuing new kicks. You know what I mean? Like if you look mm-hmm. just in, in, in aesthetic underground pop culture kind of thing of the past, looks like, you know, going from the fifties on, there was like always like something there was like looking to get fucking, you know, kicked in the nuts in a new fucking way. Mm-hmm. Sure. And that, that seems to have kind of come to a grinding halt where, cause there's so much history is, a, is, a, is that what weighed them down? I have no fucking idea, but it's like they're caught in the past. It's just kind of bizarre to me. They are. And I think you said a lot of them have, have had their balls sort of taken away from them, you know, because of, a, of all this shit. You know what I mean? It's just, like you said, it's just, that's, it's that's so, usually yeah. the time when, when that, that rebellious quotient usually fucking would it, rise it usually up. kicks in, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Seemingly would kick in to go, yeah, not buying it. Mm hmm. How about two of these, you know? No, I, I totally agree, man. You know what was cool about the, the, you know, the color of noise was, you know, the film really, it really honed in on the, on that whole post rock community. You know, it had, you know, all those the prominent artists at the time, like like Kozik, like Derek Hess, and Chris Cooper, and you know, and all those guys, they all worked, you know, congruently there, with, with, you know, with you and Amrap, and uh, and you know, as you said, you know, it's just such a, a different, you know, totally different thing compared to you know the nineties, you know, than how it is today, obviously, and um, and you know, you yourself, you've really, you know, kind of honed in on your own artistic endeavors there with your imprint Hayes double XL, which is something that you really were able to focus on more once, you know, Amber Up downsized its operation there in the, ni- in the late nineties. And, uh, I know from the film, you know, your specialty was with the lino cuts and, uh, which is, you know, really ex- uh, featured extensively in there. And I'm not, I'm not sure if you, you still do it, but I know you were also continuing, you know, your, your impassioned for music and art with conducting your own like art exhibits while you'd have like a band perform, you know, as you know, with the Melvins that was, you know, depicted in the film there, is that something you still, continue to do or is it yeah, you know? we're still, still doing all sorts of angles on stuff like that and getting ready to launch a few different things i mean the records have been chugging along steadily mm-hmm. uh it's been kind of a weird weird mix of you know reissues mixed with uh new melvin stuff and a few other odds and ends mm-hmm. mixed in there it all kind of depends on what's going on sure at that moment once again there's no set rules of like it's got to be a reissue from 20 to 25 years ago previous sales have to bring it's nothing like that <laughs> you know it's, yeah. it's a, a, we're going to do this you know bash 17 so uh, we want to do a couple things in conjunction with that so we'll get all the bands that are playing do, we'll do a 10 inch of that we'll get this thing we'll do that you know that kind of stuff sure and bumps and things around working on different um yeah like art tie, art shows tied in with like uh last Last year did a cool one with uh, me and, and my wife Lisa and Mackie and Buzz did an art show down in Texas. Buzz did like a solo set as part of that, and you know, just different things like that. But uh, yeah, just kind of picking it up and trying to keep it to the shit I liked the first time. And the reason I quit was because everything else got in front of making records. Mm-hmm. You know, the fun part was like doing the cover and making you know physically getting the record out there sure that to me was the part that fascinated me and drew me to it in the first place mm-hmm. it wasn't talking to college radio stations or hiring a pr person to handle that or sure schmoozing up to try to get your band in on this thing at the south by south that kind of shit drove me fucking nuts i'm I, not a fan i totally agree with you ben I, uh, yeah I, I when i did my label i, so I this, can't stand that shit and this no. way i got it back you know i got it back to that mm-hmm. and i'm keeping it at that it's mm-hmm. like we'll get, I'll get you know, get some shit online because I'll do small runs, and they're expensive. They're you know, it's funny because it's like people flip out because it's like a fifty dollar album. Well, motherfucker, if this was a print, it would cost you one hundred and fifty dollars. You know, yep, mm-hmm. it's a silk screen print. It's like you know, the records themselves will cost fifteen to seventeen dollars a piece to make. Mm-hmm. And we do a small run just so it's like we don't have a warehouse, we don't have uh, a distributor, you know, distribution, and so it's just like we put it out, it sells out, we move on to the next thing. Like I said, mm-hmm. keeping it focused on the fun part, which is making the stuff. Mm-hmm. It's not stocking the stuff and, you know, tracking sales from an album from four years ago, the median act, you know, that it's like, mm-hmm. fuck, shoot me. No, I um, mean, it is. That's that's all the pain, you know, the S part, the whole business aspect of it. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned, yeah, the fun part is obviously the creation of everything and then uh, 
it's a sales part. That's the part I, I couldn't stand either. It just it was not my DNA to do all that. And um, yeah, what years you know. were you, you were you cranking? What years were you uh, well, most I, active? Really, between it was on two thousand five to about two thousand nine. It was around that area. I mean, it was right in the worst the worst period you could imagine to really start a label. You know yeah, I mean? no, I mean, I, yeah. I saw, I saw, like, literally saw the writing on the wall. That's why I bagged in '98 the first time because I was like, I was just going to ask you that. Be I was going to ask you. That. I mean, I was going to say you're either really lucky, or you're pretty damn, uh, you know, business savvy individual. No, it, it, so, it, yeah. it was pretty obvious. Like sales were declining, and, and I thought it was just us, right? right? Like, you know, our median sales were here. Also, they dropped down, uh, and you're like, what the fuck's going on? And so you start digging around and talking to other labels and other bands and distributors and realizing like, now this is an industry fucking trend. And with the internet coming up fast and furious, like watching Napster, I don't know, like I said, the writing to me, the writing was on the wall. Like this, this Mm -hmm. is all going to change. And it did, you know, and then, you know, it's like, that's why the way of doing stuff now is a reflection of that. It's one of the slogans is, you know, why is this record so expensive? Because music is fucking free. It's like, you can go find this record 20 minutes after we put it out, you will find it somewhere online for free. I acknowledge that. That's that's life in the new world. I'm not pissing a owner about it. But if you want the Chotsky, this special thing that we made, you're going to fucking pay for it. And that's kind of the new design because, the you know, people will freak out. It's like, you know, records should only be nine ninety nine, like it's fucking 1984. And you're just yeah, like, I dude, know. that that model died. It died a long that time ago. Fucking, mm-hmm. It crashed and burned, you know. Yeah, it's not coming Pretty back. Pretty hard. Yeah, it's not coming back either. It's never coming back. Yeah. I love when they say, like, you know, final sales are the hugest they've been. It's like, motherfucker, Beach Boys sold that many of a single in one fucking summer. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? When, and the, the entirety of final sales right now. You know what I mean? Sure, no, I know. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, yeah, it's it's just, like you said. It's, you dude, know. I used to joke, and I would make shit for bands, like I did, I did for Boss Hog. Where it's like, I made a gold record. We always called it punk rock gold. If you could sell 10,000 copies of something, that's punk rock gold. Mm-hmm. Like in sure. the small backwater indie world that we were in, that would make, you know, you, you fucking sold 10,000 something, like a physical fucking release now. You have Warner Brothers kind of sniffing around going, what's going on here? Different different world. Much different, man. But I mean, I, I, I think roll with the punch is like, I, to, my, to my mind, it's just like, uh, you know, YouTube is the new radio. That physical medium was the only way we could get it. I wouldn't. I don't think I'd be any different now if I could find everything I want mm-hmm. just by bouncing around different websites and downloading it. I'd be fucking stoked. Absolutely. I hated when I had to pay. You know, seventy. You know, back then when I wanted to find out new music, you know, we, there was no. We had no format where we can go and just listen to any songs or you know check out a, a couple of the songs on the new record. You had to really just take a chance, suck it up, throw down. You know, fifteen ninety nine plus take, for that. CD. Oh yeah, there was a whole. A whole lot of judging books by the cover. Exactly. That's when what you're you talking do about it. labels. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you're talking about labels, that's why labels were so important to me. Cause it's like, you know, Homestead or, or touch and go or discord. Like I knew I had about a fucking seven fifty chance with the, if it were coming out of those labels. So, yep. You know what I mean, you're batting that, you know, way over 500 where it's like, Ooh, these guys are, they, they got something going on that I dig and I align myself with. Because two out of three times, I'm fucking stoked with what I get. You're happy with what you get, yeah. No, I mean... And that wasn't the case with so many other, you know, Warner Brothers, that was meaningless. Exactly. I mean, everyone forgets there was, like, actually a lot of killer, like, 77 and post-punk shit done by major labels, you know? So I didn't have, like, an anti-major label thing because it was, like, if you wanted a public image record, you're buying it off Virgin. If you want that Pistols album, you're buying it from, you know, basically, Warner Brothers in the state. You know what I mean? It was, like, totally. the Clash on CBS. I didn't... To me, it wasn't like that. That Tim Yohannan world hadn't been set up yet, where it's like everything there is bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but, but the same token, CBS didn't carry any weight with me because they were also Tammy Wynette. You know what I mean? Sure. Mm-hmm. It, didn't, it didn't mean shit to me. Whereas, like, I started noticing, like, after three or four records, like, that were just amazing to me. What's this Homestead thing? You know. Mm-hmm. So if I saw that logo, which wasn't a very good logo. My, you know, <laughs> but, it, but it carried a shitload of weight because it was like, you know, some amazing shit going on there. Yeah, you think they've just Definitely. got something new that's, you know, fresh and, uh, you know, that, like you said, and, and as long as they're, you know, two out of three or you know, whatever, you know, of those records that you bought from that label are good, you're just going to keep, you know, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a risk worth taking, a financial risk worth taking by, and that's also the whole thing. And, that, that, and that was such a, like you said, too, that was a big fucking deal because, I mean, that's, you know, you're making fucking four bucks an hour plunking down 10, 12 bucks for an import album. 
you better fucking like it because you know. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. No, that the, yeah, the, the pain was real. But by the same token, it seems like they having that 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 drive to search shit out not there on because it was like a there was a challenge to it. Sure. Yep. And it's like I, I remember I remember spending fucking so many afternoons like with Steve Turner from Mud Hunting when I was out in Seattle, where we were just driving off from record store to record store. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to put together the, the history of shit we dug, like, you know, obscure, weird punk stuff, at, which seemed old then, which was like, because it was five years old. Mm -hmm. You know, some weird, obscure punk single from Louisiana or, or underground, you know, D.C. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, as well as new things. But yeah, that was a, that was like a uh, an obsession. I realized later on it wasn't because I was an obsessive record collector. I was a fucking music collector. You, yeah, music junkie, just wanted to hear what's new. It's like I you, just you wanted need to hear fix. new stuff. It was like, yeah. and it was really you know the hard, the obscure shit was fucking impossible. It, it didn't even have to be obscure. I mean, even that stuff like Misfits was hard to come by. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to find those singles even back then in the late seventies, early eighties was fucking nigh impossible. Um, and, and it was like an event but, back then. You know, you go to a record store like we used to. You know, we'd go to record stores in New Jersey, just take an hour plus trip because we knew they'd have, you know, certain labels had certain things that you couldn't find at your local record stores at the time. It was a whole event. You'd go with your friends, you'd save, you know, take a uh, hundred oh, yeah. bucks those with you. The, those stores that had their shit wired. Oh, yeah. It's totally. Like, man. Uh, uh, Orfolk, Joker Puss, or in, in Minneapolis, or Fallout Records in Seattle. It's fucking, you know, phenomenal. You knew you weren't mm -hmm. working out of there without something. Mm -hmm. I mean, half the time, it's like the staff was so on fucking top of it. You know, they'd be playing something like, what the fuck is that? That's mm -hmm. fucking amazing. You know, what are you guys playing? That type of thing. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's like going going into the old man turf of bitching, but you're just yeah, like, I know. That can, <laughs> can never replace. You can't. I mean, that's, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's true. Oh, it is. No, and it's something that this, you know, this the younger generation, unfortunately, these kids are never going to really experience it. And to them when they just, you know, it's it's lost so much of its value. You know, we, we talk a lot about this on on the podcast. It's just... Music's lost so much of its value because it is free, and because it's just just right there for the taking whenever you want it. You know, they don't. A lot of the you know the kid, young kids they don't realize like what a struggle it was to find this stuff. And it was it was sort of like you said it was a, you had to go on hunts and it was adventure to find it. It was especially for a specific record you wanted to get. You know, um, you know it wasn't like every record store had it, so it was sort of like uh, it was exciting in a way. So that when you found it, it was like this this great achievement you had internally you just all fired up like wow, I, f I fucking found it. i've been looking for this thing forever and boom here it is so uh it's just something unfortunately they're never gonna really be able to experience um like you said i know we're sounding like old you know cranky old guys but um it's just but it was uh, that, that, that that battle like you, you, you were so vested at that point that that kind of changed the way you perceived the whole thing mm -hmm. and that's like you know the reason same thing we were talking about like with uh, labels the same thing with record stores and zines like you know forced exposure mm -hmm. Being one of those magazines at that point in time, like early AMREP, was fucking vital because it's like those guys were launching uh, huge salvos. Like uh, first time I ever heard anyone mention the Scientists, which were like a fucking amazing Australian band, like that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Not only are they fucking unheard of, those guys, you know, putting them on the cover, full article, that kind of shit. You're just like, uh, so there was a fan team thing. So you like had to have you had to be fine tuned to like all this, you know underground shit that was just not available anywhere like if you wanted to find that magazine you had to find the right fucking place that would even carry those kind of magazines mm -hmm, totally you know, right place would carry those records so it was like this constant uh struggle mm -hmm. that was enjoyable but it definitely put a, 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 a seriousness to it mm -hmm. that seems to be lacking because like you said it's all free it's all available uh, that niche is always there for me to find it's not going anywhere you know mm -hmm. i can run on 27 videos on youtube and look up you know whatever genre I want, whenever I want. So what's the big deal? I don't got to get to it. So yeah. it's, it's kind of like, I mean, I, got, I guess I'm just going to talk it on my ass because they haven't completely analyzed it, but it definitely, different aspects of it strike me regularly where you're just like, well, I mean, that's something that died with that. No, it's, like I said, it's... Uh... I mean, the strange struggle you could be set for uh, pornography. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're right. That's, that's true. That's a whole other topic. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. No, that's, 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 that's you're exactly right, man. Absolutely. Everything's right at your fingertips, man. Like I said, there's no... Uh, and and yeah. I saw some, some uh, meme, I said, fuck, I'm going to butcher it, but it's basically saying, you know, they always said that once people had access to all the information, they, we'd be so much better off. And it's like, yeah, it didn't really happen I think way. not, yeah. Yeah, I really want to thank you coming on, uh, Tom, and, and talking, you know, to us about AMRAP. Yeah, thanks, and, for, uh, thanks for haranguing me into it. I need yeah. that sometimes. But I get busy and like I'll read something and go, yeah, I'll get right back to that. And then fucking two months later, 
Yeah, I, like I said, you're a busy guy, man. No problem, you know. And uh, and I encourage our audience to go ahead and check out the Color of Noise. It's a great documentary uh, on Tom and you know and uh, and the uh, Family Reptile Records. And you can buy it on DVD through Amazon and other retail sites. And, and I know you know the uh, the uh, MREP uh, Records. Uh, w- website is still up right on uh amphetamine reptile.com and i was kind of more more uh kind of switched over like facebook and instagram type of thing to there's like uh there's an amphetamine reptile site that's kind of hilarious because it's like parts of it are 15 20 years old still chugging along really nice hey it's cool it's pretty cool though you <laughs> it's know just a hash patch of bullshit but and, and you still and you still um i, I know the, the a lot of this stuff's out of, out of print, right? You know, but the back catalog, I guess, you could stream that, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah, some, a lot of it's up there, and like I said early on, you can find it all for free somewhere. Sure. <laughs> and what about for you know the your Hayes uh, Double XL? Where can people go to uh, look into uh, you know some of your artwork that you do? Uh, best place is just under like Thomas Hazemeyer on Facebook, where most of the shit gets posted. Some of it will get posted on the Melvin, some of it gets posted on the Amra page, but that's that's one good place to kind of check out for lots of art hey man tom really appreciate it man thanks again and um you, thank uh, you thanks appreciate your your insight and everything and uh, yeah man have a good one take care you too bye thank you for listening to the shockwave skull sessions podcast subscribe and listen to all episodes by going to our pages on itunes spreaker youtube spotify and more you can listen to all other episodes and access up-to-date information and news on the shockwave skull sessions podcast by going to our website at www.shockwaveskullsessions.com. Email all comments, questions, and suggestions to shockwaveskullsessions at gmail.com.